Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, the last panel discussion we have today. Um, obviously, I didn't get the dress code memo, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but if somebody can uh, have me a cap, then I put, fit in a little bit uh, better, I guess. Um, how to prevent battery fires? It's a question that maybe many people do not realize when they're using an, uh, their micro-mobility solution, but it's actually becoming a more and more serious problem. Uh, my name is Ron. I work for SAE International. SAE is one of the biggest organizations in uh, standardizations. You don't know this name, but you are using us every day. For example, when it comes to the term horsepower, or when we talk about SAE autonomous driving levels one to five. But without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce the panel over here. And who can do that better than the people themselves? Robin, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Robin Pijnakker. Um, I'm Managing Director of Flame Aviation in the Netherlands. And uh, Flame Aviation is representing Cellblock. And Cellblock is a company uh, out of uh, the United States, uh, focusing on uh, uh, charging stations and uh, storage systems for lithium-ion batteries. That's what, uh, that's what we do. Mike? Uh, hi, my name is Mike. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Wiz. It's an e-bike subscription service for delivery drivers in New York. So we are quite a fresh company, just 15 months old, but growing fast in New York, operating like around 1,000 bikes. And uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, Jeff, go ahead, yeah. please. Hi, I'm Jeff, uh, CEO and founder of Mobile Locker. Mobile Locker developed and invented uh, a safe cabinet with fire detection and fire retardants for uh, safe storage and charging of uh, micro-mobility lithium batteries. Got it. Maurice, last but not yes. least. Hello, my name is Maurice van Kiesen. I am the director of Cleantron. And uh, we are a company that uh, develops and produces lithium-ion batteries. Uh, we do that here from the Netherlands, in New Venep, close to Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. We have a, a factory, and um, there are about um, 60, 70 people working for us, and we have an office in uh, France and in Munich, in Germany. And uh, uh, we sell uh, basically batteries in the industrial market, so we supply into companies like uh, Toyota, uh, and to the mobility market. That's why we're here. So we have an interesting group of people. Um, now, and the first question that I'd like to ask is basically to you all, how does the battery catch fire? What happens? Why does the battery catch fire? Uh, Maurice, would you like to start, please? Um, yes, there are uh, different aspects of a battery. Um, we start with the cells, uh, the cells design and the quality of the cell. Because if there is a battery fire, it is basically uh, a fire inside the cell. Um, the cell design is crucial in that matter, so that's quality. And to a lesser extent, the chemistry is important. Look, you have NMC, which is well known from Tesla. And you have uh, LFP, which is uh, having less energy uh, content, but they are both flammable. Apart from the cell, you have... Um, the way the battery is built up from cells into a battery pack. There are all kinds of regulations and guidelines for that, distances between cells, uh, how the uh, heat is um, uh, extracted from the module. Then you have the BMS, the battery management system, which is there for safety in the first place. The battery management system is an electronic device that measures the cells and intervenes when there is an unsafe condition. And um, Normally, batteries don't catch fire unless there is an abuse condition. An abuse means that it is used outside the window it, for which it is designed, or if somebody is fiddling in the battery, so is opening the battery, doing something and closing it again, uh, which is some practice in the, the bike industry. Uh, people call it repair, and that is basically, we call it compromising a battery that could be a cause of fire later on. I see. Um, so basically what I'm hearing is that we have a part that is um, designated to the quality of the battery and then there's a part also about uh, misuse. Um, regarding the misuse, assuming that uh, the majority of the batteries in the market um, 
are not top-notch uh, quality. Uh, Robin, what do you see, um, what kind of mistakes do you see happening uh, when using a battery by consumers? Well, uh, actually, in addition to what Maurice says, uh, another cause for uh, uh, fires in batteries is damage of batteries. Uh, when they get damaged, um, in aircraft you see that when a, a smartphone is being cracked in between the seat, that's the major cause for fires in aircraft. Uh, you can imagine the same for batteries of bikes or whatsoever, when they fall on the ground or they are not always handled very properly or carefully. Uh, you might not see that's, that there's something wrong inside of the battery, but there could be something wrong. Yeah. Okay. So just for my imagination, uh, how many um, fires do we have in an aircraft uh, caused by batteries? Is this because I see that on, on the movie and I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, Never yeah. noticed that. Approximately once a week, somewhere in the world, there's an aircraft, an in-flight fire. Uh, caused by uh, by a battery, by a lithium-ion battery in See. a smartphone, in uh, in a, uh, an iPad or a power bank, something like that. So I don't know for batteries in bicycles. I don't know if there are statistics for that. But yeah, there's I, a similar. I know it's always uh, yeah. a week. Every week there's a fire in the Netherlands mm. by average. And okay. it's similar, it's uh, basically a, a, you call it uh, damaging abuse. Uh, we call it uh, and that. Uh, that the battery is fallen down, breaking, or opened, or and that can cause uh, eventually a fire. And the, the risky thing is that you, if the incident happens, it doesn't immediately always result in a fire. It could over time, okay, in the middle of the night, re yeah. result in a fire. Um, Mike, you owe about 1,000 bikes, or you have a fleet of about 1,000 bikes. Um, do you happen to have a lot of fires within your fleet? Yeah, we are lucky to have, uh, like I said, we operate in 15 months. Okay. So we are lucky to have zero fires yet. But uh, in New York, there is a, this is a huge issue. So in 2022, there were like 300 fires caused by batteries, lithium batteries in bikes. So it's like a major issue for the city safety right now. I mean, like I said, we are lucky to have zero yet, but some someday it probably happens. Mm -hmm. So we are just trying to be ready. So I believe that your model is to lease out uh, the bike to, to uh, the, yeah. the end user. Um, do you also provide um, information how to safely handle the battery? Yeah, so we are rent out our e-bikes to delivery drivers in New York on a monthly basis. So legally, if the fire happens, it's legally not on our side. But obviously, we are super interested for this not to happen. So we actually can do three things. The first one is to strictly uh, doing all the certification and all the stuff authorities ask for. So our batteries and our bikes are all certified. This is, I mean, I think the most important thing. The second one is the uh, very detailed instructions about how to use it. So when we um, rent out the bike, in, we do it in person, so people come to our office. So we provide them with all these, you know, flyers and information, etc. And the third one, we ask them if they have an accident or any kind of damage, and they have an accident quite often, to be honest, in New York. Uh, so we ask them to come to the uh, to our locations in Manhattan or in Brooklyn, and uh, to show us the battery, so okay. we can check it. So these three things we can do. And one of the other things I heard that in New York, um, that some buildings, uh, residential buildings, they do not allow to bring up your battery uh to to your own home to to charge it there i heard about that you can charge few batteries like you okay. can do it for instance in our office we can swap batteries because we can't charge uncharged batteries like we can't put it like five batteries in a row and charge it so it's restricted I, i'm not sure i guess one battery you can do it but probably maybe some buildings put this additional restrictions okay jeff um, do you think that there's a solution that might be uh, considered in the future that um, it's mandatory to have a certain um, locker or a certain designated place where people should charge their, ba uh, their batteries, preventing residential buildings, especially the high-rise, uh, catching fires? Yeah, uh, we see that uh, already coming up in any kind of legislation, for example, in, in the Netherlands and also in New York, they're prepping up new legislation where they're saying, if you're going to charge indoor or, for example, in lots of apartment buildings, they're going to charge 
in a basement because no, there's no room up there. And yeah. then if you charge in a basement, there's a danger that you get some sort of a chimney effect if the thermal runaway is, uh, is happening there. So there are going to be new regulation in place that there needs to be more place between charging of the batteries. There's going to be a limit on the, on the watt hour per battery. Uh, plus detection inside, so there will be measures in place which kind of product will be needed there. That's, I think they will leave that open to the market, but they will direct more and they will look at the amount of kilo of lithium that will be available on one location and what type of uh, location it is. And we already see that happening also in the Netherlands with the PGS 37 uh, uh, legislation, although it's not already in full effect, but they also see that there's a, for bigger locations, eh, uh, where you go above 330 kilos of lithium or something, there will also be very specific measures. And from that legislation on, I think insurance companies, for example, will make directives on how to handle uh, companies and big apartment or residential buildings eh, to limit the safety factor. Yeah. Uh, to ex increase safety, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine like um, in, in uh, places like Amsterdam or, or other places in the Netherlands where the space is limited, that, that a locker would be challenging uh, to, to enforce. Are there any other solutions that you can think of that the consumer directly can do in order to prevent um, a, a battery catching fire? Well, the most important thing, thing, I think, is common sense. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, you need to make the people aware that you're not handling just a normal commodity, uh, you're, you're, you're handling something that, ha that has a safety factor that, or that, it's a, that has a safety issue. So you need to think on where you place this battery. So you need to, as an, I think as a government, you need to inform and create a lot more awareness to any kind of, of, of actor in, in, into this market. So uh, it all starts with, with think, that thinking that the battery is more an asset that has uh, uh, a potential liability there and that starts with common sense okay that's all already the beginning i think eh? uh, before you take uh, any active measures um right um maurice um when the battery catches fire um it doesn't appear to be like a normal fire or something that that starts like very small and uh, but it's it's a sudden fire this uh, causes a lot of uh, accidents Usually uh, serious accidents, I have to say, use, uh, especially when it's uh, happening during uh, the night. Um, how do you see this uh, in relation to the quality of the battery or, or like maintenance to the battery? Um, do we need to get a battery passport, for example, in the future? Or how do we know that the battery is still OK when, when we use a battery at home? Yeah, there are basically two aspects to that. First of all, the design of the battery. Uh, there is already uh, an EN50604, uh, it is called, a regulation from the European Commission about to be, uh, become legal, which is looking after the functional safety of batteries. And functional safety is not the same as normal safety. Functional safety goes way beyond that. It's all going through all the scenarios, what could possibly go wrong. It's also how cars are designed. And it, in battery country, it will separate the boys from the men because <laughs> it will make it difficult to develop uh, just like that a battery has just done now. So that make, makes, the bat, makes the battery uh, more intelligent and uh, it, the amount of incidents that happen, need to happen before it catches fire are way more. So the chance is way smaller. Um, Secondly, there is a, a battery, many batteries like ours, they measure everything and they communicate. So they can tell how they feel. I, they can tell, uh, they dropped me. Uh, it's too warm, it's too cold. All these messages we can bring together, you know, some kind, we call it state of health message. And that could be also a warning message. It's, I don't feel very well, it means I'm disturbed. Then could be a signal. And that signal could be used and sent to, for instance, a cabinet or to your phone or to the fleet owner, and the battery has to be removed to a safe location. And once a battery catches fire, it's not the battery itself that catches fire, it's basically the electrolyte, the liquid which is in the cell, starts to become gas. And to avoid that, the little cell will explode there's a little vent, and that vent blows out the gas, and the gas is flammable for any chemistry. And that's how the, the fire starts. Normally it's like 
fireworks with one cell basically giving uh, gas and gas a certain moment in time becomes a fire and then it propagates to the neighbors. And dependent on the design of the battery pack, that goes quickly or that takes a long time. If you have a good design, it takes a long time. So it gives uh, the, the users still the opportunity to remove the battery to a safe location. But once it is on fire, you cannot uh, really extinguish it. You can only bring it below uh, with the coolant, for instance, uh, burning temperature, so it stops burning. But once you stop cooling, it starts catching fire again. That's what you often hear. That makes it a dangerous event, and that's why it needs to be avoided. Yeah. Robin, I'm sure you have something uh, to uh, say about it, that uh, once it catches fire, you cannot um, uh, stop it anymore. Um, what do first responders, uh, responders have to do? Or do you think that everybody um, in their own home should have a basic kind of education about what to do when a battery catches fire? I mean, what kind of solutions are there? Yeah, well, um, preventing a battery fire is difficult. You can maybe predict it, like uh, uh, Maurice is saying. Uh, another thing that you should consider maybe is uh, how to uh, limit the escalation of, uh, uh, of a lithium-ion battery fire. Uh, and that's what you, what you say, uh, common sense is, is a point there. So if you charge uh, only one battery, uh, make sure you do it in an environment where it cannot ignite many other things when, uh, when it would, uh, when it would uh, catch fire. Um, um, and on the other side, if you are charging more uh, batteries, uh, 5 or 10 or 50 or 100, um, there are solutions for uh, charging them uh, in compartments uh, whereby if a lithium-ion battery uh, catches fire, um, it can get neutralized uh, on that particular place and the rest of the batteries do not immediately also catch fire. So um, at least you buy time with yeah. it. Um, so yeah, All those right. kinds of solutions. Yeah. So, yeah, because you noticed, you, you mentioned that in the airplane, a battery catches fire. I, I'm just curious what happens then. Uh, the, the, then the, um, uh, the air host is coming. How do they deal with yep. that? I can imagine that some such kind of solution can also be implemented at home yep. when you have a small back, battery well, fire. Well, in aircraft, they have boxes or bags, uh, which are explosion proof and uh, fireproof. And uh, um, once there is a little battery in a smartphone or whatsoever that catches fire, they try to extinguish it, they try to cool it down with water and then try to get it into the box or in uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, and then close the box and keep it that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm hearing is there's uh, the, 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 we can take measurements based on quality, um, maybe on the, on the battery that comes in. So we have legislation over there. Uh, prevention, so it means um, that we have to uh, that the consumer or, or the user is informed about it. Um, and then also, um, yeah, what happens if? Um, if we have to prioritize that, or what's the fastest um, way that we can think of now, what's the easiest to implement, um, how to deal with less fires um, in, in, in the battery? And this is a question to you all. Go ahead, I Jeff. think the fastest way is just a massive information campaign. I mean, that's really fast set up can be oriented by the government. If you already bring that out, I think that will already reduce information on how to handle a battery, how to use a battery, when you need to bring the battery back, when it's a risk. Uh, also an information campaign to the first responders, how they need to tackle or attack uh, a lithium fire uh, um, incident. Uh, that's, that all starts there because uh, we regularly even get calls from fire departments in Europe, uh, how do we tackle uh, a lithium ion uh, fire eh? because we do lots of lots of testing on this um, so you see there's still even with the with the first responders who should know it there's a limit of of uh, of knowledge i think the the ones who are gaining a lot of knowledge at this moment are the insurance companies eh? you see that already they're saying listen if you have too many batteries in a building we're not going to insure your building anymore so that's uh, really becoming an issue but i think uh, that would be the fastest way Legislation will be needed for sure, but that takes usually a bit of time. Eh? Uh, I know the European Commission is, for example, already taking over some Dutch uh, legislation there to roll out quickly. 
Um, and then I think also some standards, the best practices, uh, which will probably be driven also by insurance companies eh, for larger locations. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you mentioned you don't have any fires in your bikes, but there are many fires in New York. What, what's the difference, do you think, between the, the batteries that catches fires and, and your program? Is there, is that, has, does that have something to do with quality or maintenance? I'm, honestly, I'm not an expert in batteries, so we operate fleet. Uh, but we just we are just trying so we trying to take it simple to, to keep it simple. We're just trying to do it all certified. Yeah. They ask us, and it works actually. And do do your clients have to come back for periodic checkups um, for the battery health, for example? Yeah, that helps. Like I said, but uh, our our um, customers they have a lot of appointments because they use bikes heavily like 1000 uh, kilometers per month so most of them are appearing at our office at least i would say one time in two months uh, so any of our customers get to our office to make some repair or something and this is a chance for us to uh, check the battery also so i guess it helps also because like i said if there's any accident or damage or something we ask them to come and uh, we exchange the bike or we change the battery, etc. So it helps a lot. I see. Yeah, I just want to add about the, we are talking a lot about bicycles and light electric vehicles. And as an engineer looking at, uh, we, we, could also, we also sell um, batteries in other markets, but batteries on a particularly a bicycle, I mean, that is in religious terms, hell for a battery. Uh, the, the, its life is way worse than in a car. It, the vibrations, then the, the temperature changes, the way it is used. Water. And to stay in that, that, uh, that uh, metaphor, if that is hell, the, the bicycle repairman is the antichrist for the battery because we are uh, producing uh, about 100,000 e-bike batteries. Uh, and we, when we get batteries back for repair, as soon as we can see somebody has opened the pack and has been doing something, trying to bend something, put in something, screw something, it goes immediately out of our building into a separate vault. Because with all good intentions, it always makes the battery less safe. And that in combination with the hard life again, when it goes back into, into traffic, is an explanation for the amount of fires anyhow. So that is also, uh, I think, that legislation uh, is absolutely key. And also that batteries are designed to be repaired. They are currently not. We are showcasing here the first e-bike battery that can be repaired so without compromising on safety. And that, I think, makes a di big difference. And apart from that, it's all common sense uh, how you use the batteries uh, and um, take precautions. Yeah? So like... There is technology. We, in our factory, we have uh, um, robots that are welding um, the cells. It could be that a robot is touching the cell in the wrong way and it starts to fire. So we have automated extinguishing technology, cooling, coolants and aerosols to bring it down. It all exists. Yeah. And you can put that technology also in a, a charging cabinet, which, which is also common practice. And all these kind of things people need to do properly. Yeah, yeah. So I think we passed by the time that we tried to make the best of it. You know, it's the, the statistics are so that it, there are so many batteries around that you cannot ignore a few percentages of uh, fires because it's still a lot. Yeah, so uh, I think everybody has the responsibility to do it in a, in a responsible way. Yeah, um, of course, when we're looking at um, it, as a consumer buying an e-bike, looks at the price quality and uh, the battery maybe is overlooked um, in that aspect because it's not the first thing that the consumer will look at um, what would you what what kind of message do we have why would people choose for a higher quality battery um, besides that their home will burn down basically <laughs> but what what other triggers or motivation can you give uh, can you give an end user yeah, a lifetime. Eh? So uh, the battery will last longer. It will become more reliable anyhow because of the integrity of the design. Uh, there's no soldering. There's no uh, adhesive. There's no silicons used. 
These are all assembly technologies that are not good to repeat. Yeah, so you can never master the exact quality of it. Shrink foil also absolutely out of the question because every time it's a little bit different. And with high amounts, a little bit of fluctuation gives already uh, a, sh a few cases of fires at the end of the day. So people should be sensitive to that uh, be and uh, responsible to that. We should bring the e-bike battery on the level of the automotive battery. And, uh, and, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean a more expensive battery. Not necessarily. It does not. Okay. Uh, because uh, quality costs are also costs. Exactly. So a lot of e-bike manufacturers, they have a lot of costs because of breakdowns. And instead of using all that money to fiddle around with the batteries and send them backwards and forwards, all those costs put it in the quality of the product and the, and the, um, the risk is lower. Okay. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, there are possibilities from the audience to ask questions. But before we do that, I'd like to uh, ask the whole panel if there's any technology that you see coming up in the future that you're excited about to share. Go ahead, Robin. To be excited about? Yeah, very excited about. <laughs> Especially on this topic, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, the technology that, uh, that you can see uh, the health status of a, of a battery. Uh, for a lot of batteries, that is not available yet, but uh, it's a technology that's coming up, uh, I've learned. And uh, so that you can see what's the health status of that battery. Uh, do I need to be concerned or not? Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting development. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I'm a bit confused because uh, I had some <clears throat> optimistic expectations of new chemistry technologies. Like, I'm, uh, for instance, in New York, authorities are trying to switch fleet operators to f uh, lithium phosphate batteries. So uh, that was part of our strategy this year to try lithium phosphate instead of lithium batteries. But five minutes before getting on the scene, we talked to Maurice and he, he, he said he's not that optimistic <laughs> in a, like... It yeah. was a bit different words, but still. Uh, so right now I'm a bit confused. So uh, like I said, we want to try lithium phosphate batteries and um, New York authorities want us to try this. So maybe yeah. this is the next step, but. If, if I may add to that, the, what I told him is that uh, lithium iron phosphate burns less good, uh, but yeah. in our labs, we always do destructive testing. It burns very well. <laughs> in here in the Netherlands, uh, Picnic, famous online supermarket, two distribution centers burned down due to LFP, lithium iron phosphate batteries. So it's still dangerous, but it is less sensitive. And the risk of the perception that it is less sensitive is that people take less care. And therefore yeah. you have yeah. a counter effect that at the end of the day, the risk gets bigger. So we, do, we produce both, yeah? And, uh, but um, for us, the, the safety measures for both chemistries are identical. There's no change, no difference between them. But in the market is the perception that, uh, that it is less, uh, uh, less dangerous. Um, but but, it but is can, still can, can we use lithium phosphate and don't tell our customers that it's lithium phosphate? <laughs> yeah. We should <laughs> still think that it's lithium. So. Yes, at least uh, be careful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, anything you're excited about? Oh, uh, <laughs> excited is a big word, but uh, what I see is I think um, new technology will come around and uh, maybe the chance uh, that something will happen might slowly decrease, but the effect is still big. Eh? Chance by effect can give a disaster. So, um, and I think the energy density is also increasing in batteries so that if effect side will still increase. So by the end of the day, by the end of the day, Micromobility solutions are, can always be ma manipulated. Uh, so I think the only solution there is to inform and also take control as a, a location-driven control there. And I think that should be the, the future. Together, of course, with warning, like a BMS system that can maybe warn to your home smart system, uh, listen, this battery is out of control, get out. Eh? Because the most important thing with lithium-ion is time. You need to have time because lithium ion thermal runaway is extremely fast. Maybe to, on to end, uh, they did a test in Poland on the battery with a measurement to, uh, where they ignited the thermal runaway and it went ab above 1,200 degrees in 1 1.3 seconds. That's the time that you have. 
that's pretty fast. Yeah. Let's say, Maurice. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm answering as an engineer, so uh, you have to forgive me that. But uh, <laughs> there is uh, there are all the kind of technologies we call it predictive maintenance. We use it in the industry for big warehouse systems where you have dozens of little carts in in uh, in uh, warehouse systems uh, running around. Predictive maintenance, communication with the battery, making people aware, and uh, and like we have uh, showcased here, the the new batteries for swap feeds. They use about one hundred thousand e-bikes in the future with that new battery, uh, which is designed for repair. So that is addressing the whole uh, the whole tendency in the market to be willing to repair. We facilitated the design now. We're facilitating that with a design that allows safe repair without compromising safety so that the lifetime gets longer. It sounds good. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you have to come to the stage a little bit. Uh, I'll try to repeat your question. Hi, so regarding lithium iron phosphate batteries, I guess that's a common misconception that they're much safer than lithium ion. Can you elaborate more on the, uh, from a chemical standpoint, why they tend to uh, produce thermal runaway as opposed to the common misconception that they don't? Can you kind of give us some more explanation yeah. on why that happens? Okay, maybe you repeat yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit technical. I couldn't hear really, but you, you see what, what the difference is in chemistry in between LFP and, and NMC and why and LFP can still have a thermal runaway. Is that what you're saying? The, the, uh, the beginning of the thermal runaway is basically a short circuit. So inside the cells, there are membranes between a positive and a negative. If there's an interconnect, you get a short circuit, regardless uh, which chemistry it is. It's a short circuit is a short circuit. And a short circuit gives a spark and gives a, um, a lot of heat. And that heat will make the electrolyte uh, cook, eh, becomes gas, and that gas may, becomes flame, flammable. And that is applicable NMC, and that's applicable to LFP. So that's it. The whole uh, propagation is the same, only with uh, the uh, lithium, um, iron and phosphate, eh, we, um, Rust and fertilizer, you cannot also call it iron phosphate in versus uh, nickel, uh, uh, manganese and, and cobalt, is that uh, the NMC chemistries are a little bit more um, volatile than the um, phosphate uh, battery. And therefore it has uh, a tendency to burn a little bit later. But the process is, is there. And so it is an irreversible process. So if it goes, it goes. And uh, the volatility with NMC is quicker and faster than with LFP. That explains the difference. All right. Yeah. Um, sorry, we ran out of time. Uh, but if you have any questions, I would like you to come up to one of the panelists. Um, we walk off there. Um, and for now, I would like to thank you, thank everybody of the panelists, um, and hope you had a great evening, uh, afternoon today. Thank you.